Okay, so let me start by uh, introducing to you this picture. Now, this picture is part of the soil sampling or a few trip like, organized by another code that I teach, which is soil, uh, soil science and analysis. So these students were brought to Paya Indah, Paya Indah in Dengkil, la two years ago, where the student dig a trench uh, using their own hands and also a few holes and spades uh, to, to study the soil horizon. So during which a lot of these uh, so-called soil sampling activities has also conducted during this time. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so this is the content that we are going to explain. By the way, there are a lot of things that was repeated with, uh, with uh, what we have discussed during the first lecture. Like, for example, the site selection, the selection of sample, what are the criteria before you consider, uh, you need to consider before you're deciding the number of samples and the sampling uh, location. All of this has been discussed earlier, but I was just going to repeat what matters like, with regards to uh, soil sampling. Yeah. So, so I'm going to start with the basic principles of soil sampling. Like uh, any other monetary program, there are a few uh, objectives that you need to first predetermine before we continue and uh, go on for site sampling. Uh, now, there are four types, as you can see right here, detecting monitoring, assessment monitoring, performance monitoring, and finally, research monitoring. They all look very similar, but it's very... Uh, similar to what we have discussed earlier like uh do you have prior knowledge on the site with regards to uh, pollution if you do know that uh, the site has already been contaminated at exactly where that location is then it will be easier and it will be based on uh where is the location and then you put more samplings uh sampling uh points yeah okay so the first one, detecting monitoring. The main objective of the monitoring project is to detect the presence or absence of a given contaminant. So this one is you have a presumption that the site is not contaminated, but it may be contaminated. So you just want to, uh, you just want to see roughly, is there a pollution? This is very similar to the river monitoring that you, we discussed uh, last week, lah. Yeah where the river, you don't know when exactly is going to get polluted, so you have to constantly monitor something like this. Uh, but for your information, soil is not like water, water monitoring, where the quality of river needs to be determined 24-7. But for soil, because the impact to life is not as great, uh, so they are, not, they are not monitored. They are not monitored as closely as a river. Because why? River is the source of our drinking water. So that's why it use, it's usually uh, being monitored 24-7. And uh, so yeah, that is the main reason. Okay, next one is assessment monitoring. The main objective plan is to determine the extent of a known contamination. So this assessment means you know that there is a contamination. You just want to see uh, how bad, how, how extensive. That means how far it traveled and how concentrated is the pollution. The next one is performance monitoring. So this objective is to evaluate the feasibility and requirement financial and require financial burden for the remediation of a pre-investigated area. Now this one is very famous for the remediation project. Like you have a plan to get the site back to its original state. Like for example, a landfill example. Right? Yeah. So landfill, we all know that using soil to cover all those uh, perishable uh, municipal solid waste so that they can uh, degrade by itself. But we know like, in those ways, they have been mixed with a lot of pollutions, like uh, some of them may have heavy metals and whatnot. But nowadays, a lot of sites, especially in Lebak Lang, uh, use and reuse, yeah? reuse for uh, housing. So before they can even build houses there, they will need to first assess whether that site previously landfill 
is safe or not because we all know that landfill emit gases that may be dangerous so that's why this one needs to be studied yeah uh for your information uh somewhere in chiras i think those are the sites there are a few sites that are ppr yeah ppr where there are housing flats for 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 those uh, who are needy but they are very economical there were the sites where, where there are a lot of release of uh gases emitted from the ground and there are no there, there there is nothing the residents can do because they know they know that the site previously is landfill so they have to live with it uh, until the gas is uh, subsiding and then finally research monitoring the monitoring process can be a part of the for uh can uh, process to be a part of of a follow-up plan to eva evaluate the success of a remediation effort so compared to the previous one performance monitoring which is before the remediation is happening research monitoring is after they have done the remediation and they want to check see if the remediation is successful so many things like yeah okay now uh parts of monitoring plan so these are the things that we will uh, consider before we decide where do you want to put that uh, sampling sites um so the essential part would be site characterization number one and then followed by data acquisition data quality control interpretation and reporting so you can say that these are like encompass the almost the entire plan like, yeah? the entire plan of the soil sampling or soil monitoring plan uh which i think i will not going to explain too deeply uh later on you're going to work with other uh the course mates in order to come up with similar uh, similar monitoring plan yeah so these are the composition now yeah okay now to begin with site characterization is the prior knowledge regarding the site so now when we talk about soil the prior information regarding the site would come mainly from um the previous or, or the monitor uh, of the result coming from the previous monitoring program so this one may or may not be available uh, readily to you. If it is not re already available, then perhaps you need to do some uh, prior studies, like go to the site, do some, uh, uh, what do you say? A trial. Yeah, a trial. So you go there and take a very, very small amount of samples. So you investigate. Uh, apart from that, uh, the, the surface of the earth also needs to be investigated. While most of this so-called geological assessment will be based on site, some may just use like a remote sensing to do it. Now, uh, satellite technology nowadays, they are very advanced because we know some of the very, very remote sites like in Sabah, in Sarawak, if you want to go there, you can, but it takes like days, sometimes weeks in order to get to the actual site. So technology nowadays, they have satellite technology where they can uh, emit and they can uh, use uh, far IR, far infrared, in, uh, uh, far infrared spectrum to investigate more or less the composition or the geological makeup. In fact, this technology, so-called the satellite technology, it's used in space, like uh, in, other, in other planets where they need to survey the geology. But in Malaysia, like, yeah, I think this, this aspect has been uh, fully investigated by Jabatan Mineral and Galia. So they all have already surveyed the entire peninsula of Malaysia. Not sure about Sabah and Sarawak, but if it's not, every 20 or 30 years, the geologists la, the, under that department will go and survey every 20 or 30 years. Yeah. So based on this geological information, we know what kind of soil mineral that a site has because why now when we talk about uh soil contamination we have to remember uh, sometimes that contaminants like that heavy metal not contaminants heavy metal for example they are already in the soil it's not due to human activity you see so that you have to remember uh, why geological uh, 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 characterization is so important is that sometimes when you detect the soil have high level of heavy metal but that does not mean that the pollution is happening because originally inside the soil, geologically, it's there. I take example, uh, yeah? in Pantai Timor, 
uh, let's say for example, Rao or somewhere around Kelantan, they are thriving with a lot of mining activity. Okay. And those soil, they are special. They have gold, of course, because they, they have mining, right? That's why they have mining, they have gold. Now, alongside with this gold, geologically, they also follow along with uh, copper. So you might think copper suddenly very high in Rao. Why? It's natural. It's part of the soil. Yeah, It is not polluted. And then together with those uh, gold and copper, you also have pyrite. Pyrite is a mineral that contains iron and sulfur. And most of the time, this mineral comes along with arsenic. We cannot say the soil in route is polluted because that is natural geologically. Yeah. Okay, so the other things that uh, we need to know is geomorphic and pedological characteristics. So geomorphic covers the base map, how does the surface looks like? Geologic map, how is the, the, the minerals uh, or the geology of the, the soil mix up? The hydrologic map studies how is the flow of groundwater. Yeah, so when we talk about a hydrologic map, we, we, we not only we need to determine where is the underground, uh, underground river flow, we also need to determine the flow rate as well. So in this chapter, uh, in, in this code, in this course, we are not going to go that deep, lah, yeah, because usually that that's that, that part of the studies is reserved for geologists and civil engineers or hydrologists. We are not going to cover that part, lah, yeah. Uh, and then of course overburden. Uh, see how is the uh, now overburden, if not mistaken, represent the uh, the rocks, the rocks on, on, on the surface. So this also may, may need to be determined like that. Okay, uh, so we have class activity, but since you're alone, Gamiro, so we are not going to do this like yeah. Uh, but you can you can try like yeah. After this, you can try and Google what are these uh, so-called map call uh what what are these maps looks like, and from there you have more uh, information like yeah. And you also can watch this video like soil sampling strategy. And then they have like a so-called web soil survey tool. Some countries like in the United States, they already have like a database. Yeah, database from their prior survey. So based on this, they have prior knowledge. Like, yeah? Okay. The next part we're going to talk about is the selection of sampling approach. How do we determine our uh, sampling location? And also frequency, yeah. So these are the factors, lah. Now I think this one we have discussed before. Now, um, but I think I'm going to let you read all this, yeah. Uh, well, I think I'm going to read it for you, lah. Yeah, okay. Frequency of sampling, like last time, how frequent that you need to take the sample. Uh, when we talk about soil sample, then it is not supposed to be very mobile. So if you're talking, if you're, if you're, if you're, if we are a, a, a monitoring a site that does not have any frequent change in terms of uh, human activity, probably uh, the frequency would not be as high. Now this is, this is going to be quite frequent. The sampling would be quite frequent. If let's say the possibility of uh, repeated and constant contamination happens. Like, uh, for example, if you want to uh, monitor the site uh, of an operation, a site where they have operation of uh, human activity, like uh, the industrial area, perhaps, then the frequency is higher. If it's not contaminated, very ambient, then you may not really need to take too, too, too many samples. Okay, next one is technical procedure of sample collection. Why this is so? Because when we talk about contaminants, they may be volatile. So you need a different technique. VOC I'm talking about. Usually soil, they are quite stable, the contaminants. Um, but you may not know. Because some of the contaminants, they may be very volatile. And those are the ones that usually we are concerned. Yeah? And 
not only is for the accuracy of your data, it's also for your safety. Because VOC, once you collected it, it will start in it. And if you're carrying that, then you might be exposed. And then, of course, the objective. What exactly do you want to know? That covers the identity of the uh, contaminants and also how much they have. Uh, technical errors of the operator. So this one, um, it's out of the equation, but usually the operators may be uh, may not be well trained, so that might that might expose it to errors. Uh, but that's another different story, lah. Yeah. Usually we get the the most experienced uh, operator or, or those that knows what they're doing. Uh, yeah. The next one that will be covered further, like, is storing. How do we store soil sample? How do we handle it? Now we we'll talk about storing. That also includes uh, treatment. Yeah. So this treatment may be like a preservation of the samples. And this one also uh, re with regards to its contaminants. Some may not need treatment, but there are a few that might need it. And then, of course, lastly, transport to the laboratory. Okay, now, the next few, I'm going to go a bit quick because I have covered it a few times, either in uh, water sampling and also the first chapter we're talking about when we calculate the number of uh, samples. Uh, but with regards to soil, you have to remember soil samples is not very homogeneous. That is the fact. Because whenever you cut down the soil along the hills, for example, you're going to see many, many layers. That itself is an indication that the soil is not homogeneous. And Whenever we take samples, homogeneity of samples is very, very important. So that comes back to us. If the soil is already not homogeneous, then how do we homogenize it? It all starts with the first thing, which is what exactly do you want? If you just want a soil sample that is uh, relevant to plant growth, for example, then you will have to determine where is the root zone. Because when we say plant growth and contamination, roots do not uh, extend too far from the surface. And it also depends on what kind of plants that we're talking about. If we're talking about herbal plant, the short and grassy plants, their root is usually around 30 centimeters from the surface. So how deep do you want to take soil sample if you were looking at those herbal plants? just 30 centimeter from the top but if you want to I mean, determine the entire soil column until water table now this is not surprising because um especially the geologist yeah, who needs to determine the soil makeup and they want to determine contamination in the soil until the saturated zone saturated zone is where you have uh, groundwater uh, because why you you may want to investigate why the well water is contaminated with heavy metal then this is part of it and usually it takes up to maybe five feet to 100 meters below the surface to get to the water table so you have to you have to bore until that deep yeah so with that, then you probably need to isolate different uh, based on horizons and you analyze it. Now, deeper soil, usually they don't have too much of issue uh, because they're already compacted and not too much of uh, activities happening on the or that, that would disturb its uh, makeup. But when you talk about this surface one, you, you, you can expect, like, you can expect a lot of homogeneity. Like, the presence of rocks, they may be carried by animals even, and they may even be carried by wind. Okay, uh, and then uh, animal activity, like for example, uh, if there are presence of birds or maybe animals on the surface, they might leave some extra things on the surface. So that might be a source of uh, the error, because when soil is not homogeneous, there is only one error or oh, most likely that error will occur, which is random error. 
So in order to eliminate that, uh, to uh, to reduce it, not to eliminate, uh, random error cannot be eliminated. It can only be reduced. Or in this case, like they say, estimated. Um, so this is how. Okay, now, soil is uh, randomly distributed based on the horizon you know. And in order to reduce it, these are the two solutions, random sampling and collection of multiple increments. So if you know how the soil differs, then you're going to like determine where is the location where the soil by stars differs. Now this one refers to, for example, horizon. The deeper you go, the, 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 the soil characteristic might change. So you can do that. No need to like, mix and homogenize everything yeah so this one is the number of samples that you will need to take uh the general rule or the general rule is that you need to take more than 30 samples uh based on this graph why because based on this graph uh, this is the so-called width of confidence interval uh against the number of samples so you can see the curve starting to coming starts to come down with more number of samples until a point that it starts to stabilize. So there are two points lah where the statisticians say to be satisfied at this point, uh, 30 samples and also 50 samples. So based on your financial ability, if you think you can afford more, then perhaps you can go for more than 50. But statistician says that at least 30 at least 30 samples is what you need in fact this magic number like 30 is the, what what the soil uh, social science uh, social science people uh, also determine when they have like uh, just now i say trials guy i think in social science they have a different term pilot study yeah for social scientists they have pilot study how many samples do they need this one because during that pilot study, they will need to determine the, uh, the so-called uh, confidence level. In, in, in our scientific terms, it's called confidence level, but in theirs, it's called alpha cron bus. It's something very similar to this confidence interval. Yeah, The more samples you have, the lower it gets, and that also reflects by its uh, confidence level. Yeah. So, so you get the numbers, uh, yeah? minimum 30 or more. But I think based on what we learned earlier in the first lecture, how to calculate sample size. I think that is the one uh, that you need to determine. Yeah? You can use that formula to calculate. Now, next one is, uh, what I mean, of course, heterogeneity, we already explained. How do they, uh, how, how is the soil is not homogeneous? uh and we also discuss how is the uh, number of samples might by by my determine its precision but what about accuracy uh when we talk about accuracy we have spike sampling we have spike sample which i will explain a little bit later but i think i already explained it last week during water sample it is very similar to that uh but there's one more thing like yeah now for soil we probably don't need to spike sample because uh, there are standards, soil standards, which means that some soil that have already been analyzed and characterized by professional lab, and they have exactly the characteristic, the, I mean, the data, the data of the soil characteristic. One can determine these, uh, one can analyze like, yeah, this so-called not standard, I'm sorry. It's not called standard soil. It's called reference, sorry, yeah. There are a lot of reference available, but they are very expensive. Now, usually this uh, reference soil will be analyzed alongside with the samples that you have uh, uh, collected from the site. And that can be used, yeah. That can be used to measure the accuracy of your analysis. It's very similar like, to the spike sample in the water sampling. Yeah. Okay, now variability of constituents. Uh, 
these constituents may may be the contaminants where it depends on how volatile your contaminants is uh, but usually they are not supposed to be uh, to be very uh, variable uh, uh, with time because usually soil contaminants are quite stable yeah uh, and then final question do you need to composite the sample so that comes back to you if you have 1000 sample i don't think you want to analyze it and the solution we do have a solution in soil there is a technique called quartering technique in which the soil samples collected from several sites that are very near to each other can be mixed together yeah they mix it they homogenize it and then they downsize it so the technique to downsize this composite sample is called quartering but you see when you do that you get one composite sample that you can say represent this mixture the problem is you lose the variation so you don't know that entire site which is which which may cover a very big area you don't know where exactly that contamination is you just know the average so composite is good to minimize the number of sample and to minimize the cost but you lose a lot of data lah, in terms of the the distribution the special distribution of that contaminants in a large area okay that is if you on the economic aspect lah, you want to save money then you can do composite okay now uh this one we are not going to talk this but just want to take you through lah, yeah? now based on soil science the soil particles they are varied that is a fact that's why you have clay you have silt and you have sand and they all differ some may not be that homogenized and they have different call uh they, they have different composition in terms of particle size whereas one thing that you need to remember yeah if the particle size is very big and it increase with size the soil particles may not be as homogeneous and that is why you will need to take more sample to offset its variability um i can say why because why if you have sand sand particles yeah there are a lot of holes a lot of pores between those large particles that may house other things so in between sand grains you may have some clay but if you look at clay they are all very similar so that is why yeah of course increasing heterogeneity uh, here is not very is not very well defined because heterogeneity may be due to particle size but here it may uh it may be a lot of things like yeah, depending on what human activities or animal activities that happens on top uh so this one covers a lot of things that i think uh you get the idea like yeah um if anything that is not constant over a, a long period of time that is not natural usually that is the reason like, why you have higher red heterogeneity and with that more samples is collected uh, low constituent concentration now this one is a different story in this case some contaminants they may exist in the soil but they are too low that sometimes the 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 instrument may have a tough time trying to pick up signals they are too low so how do we do this is um, we usually collect a bit more soil and then we do some extraction so the soil have very low signal if you run directly they probably don't read anything it's very close to zero nothing but there's a technique called extraction where you can use either solvent or you can use uh, uh usually it's solvent uh, yeah because why when we have a solvent and we do extraction the constituent or the contaminants will be uh, extracted in the solvent and the solvent can be evaporated so we can evaporate it either by using heat or maybe some wind to blow it away and what's left is the 
constituent with higher concentration, then you can use it and uh, you can you can you can analyze it. Then only it will pick up signals. Yeah. But all if you have more soil sample, uh, yeah. And then of course, uh, degree of confidence. So if you want your result to be very very precise and accurate, then more samples probably is a good idea, uh, yeah. But one thing that you have to remember, cost, yeah, cost coming from logistical consideration. Uh, of course, like, you want to employ more people to collect more samples and whatnot. You have to buy more sample container. So you probably don't need that many samples like, in a certain project. But who knows, yeah? if you have a very big project, then you probably need a lot more samples. So here is an idea uh, why soil is said to be non-homogeneous. This is the old horizon where you have organic material. Then down there you have the mineral soil, but it's still black because they inherited some of the organic material from the top from the top. So you can see up here is more organic, down here is more mineral, but they all have a high organic content. They are very different. We're talking about first 30 centimeters you already have two layers. Oh, wait, this is not exactly 30 centimeters because if we go further down, then you, it also uh, encompasses a certain part of the uh, B horizon. Okay, so in this B horizon, it is more white, whitish in color, and you might find out that this is a bit sandy. It is very different. First 30 centimeters, you have three horizons. Then what do you do? Of course, now you have to you have to uh, collect soil samples up to 30 centimeters and you have to mix them up together. Yeah, you have to mix them up together, sieve it, then only you can analyze it. So that's the example. Yeah, why soil they are said to be non homogeneous? Uh, well, I think I'll take you through very quickly. Like, yeah, now this one, like I said, you, you need at least 30 samples, and then what happened is that uh if if you only can afford to uh, analyze just one out of these 30 large uh, large sample size you can make them a composite mix them together quarter them make them in smaller sample size then you will sieve it into less than two millimeters in diameter so uh in soil sampling we need to sieve it the larger ones uh soil particles larger than 2 mm will be uh, considered as coarse fraction, in which a coarse fraction usually they are not analyzed, like, yeah? they are just put aside, but they're still very much part of the analysis because in reporting, we will, we will need to report how much of boulders, how much of aggregate, and how much of coarse fraction. The composition needs to be reported. Then when it comes to analysis, you, you analyze like, this fraction, yeah? less than 2 mm. Uh, then, and the final one, final composite sample should weigh at least one kilo after sieving. So this is how much the soil sample you should collect. One kilo actually is not much, you know, I tell you. One kilo is almost like one plastic bag size. Yeah. Maybe 10 times, 10 times, 10 centimeters. Because why? Soil is very dense. So that's why they weigh a lot. And I think I will not going to talk about this one. It's a continuation of what I said. 30 samples mixed together and make a, and, and, and produce a grab sample, a grab composite sample. Uh, so just now I use one word, grab sampling. Guy. Now grab sampling is actually the technique where the soil is collected. Later I'll explain to you what are the equipments that we use to, to, take, grab, uh, to, to take grab sample. Uh, so here just now uh, you have seen the amount of soil sample is at least one kilo. Uh, but here you can eat, you can actually go down if you want to, but it all depends on what kind of analysis. Uh, general rule is one kilo. No, please don't take less than that lah. It's uh, it's going to be very not homogeneous lah. You if you want to have homogeneous one one sample, one soil sample, two kilos or above. Sometimes even 20, 30 kil uh, kilos. They use a bucket to fill it. Yeah. Okay. Now here it depends on what analysis that you want to do. Uh, but they say 200 grams. But to me, I just collected 200 gram sample and it's not really a good idea. One kilo is probably a better one. Yeah. Take more samples, but 
the only cost you may incur is just the transport, but you but you get the benefit lah. Yeah. Uh, dry mass of approximately five to one hundred gram is needed for contaminant analysis. Oh yeah, by the way, this one is for characterization. Ah uh, yeah, if you're talking about sampling, you probably need more. But if what characterization? This one very much depends on what method that you use. Some methods they need more samples, some less. But there is a fact that soil sample is not homogeneous. So when we analyze soil. Any instrument involved, usually they'll have a, a greater sample requirements, greater sample size requirement as compared to others. So that's why you can see here, sometimes you need 200 grams, sometimes 5 grams, uh, especially when you have a low concentration that you need more and then you need to do concentration, uh, extraction to concentrate the contaminants. Now this one is for bioaccumulation test where they say 15 liters is needed. Uh, reason is because there's a part where soil can be characterized based on its uh, soil organism. It's not just testing the microbes, but also its uh, insect. It's a benthic macro invertebrate assessment now this one we're going to uh, assess how much of living organism the insects the worms or whatnot inside the soil if you think not much then perhaps you probably won't see anything at all because in terms of this soil organism uh, there are many in the soil if it's not very healthy if it's healthy then you can find a lot earthworm is number one but if it is not too healthy especially when it is contaminated it's probably not going to find too many so that's why you probably need a bit more especially when the soil is extremely contaminated where life is not expected there but you cannot say that they are not there so you may need more yeah Okay, selection area, sampling point, and parameters for sampling. Let me see. Oh, yeah, this one is the uh, what we have learned before. Uh, if you remember uh, previously, we have judgmental sampling and also random sampling. It is very similar. I think this one is grid sampling that we learned before, so I think I will skip. The one that I did not cover is this one, traverse type, the traverse sampling. They have open traverse and closed traverse. Now, it does look like a map, right? Uh, a line that, uh, that it goes along in the map. And it is true. Because before we even go for sampling, first thing we need to see is the map and also its terrain. Now, it's not like when you got the map and you can point, oh, okay, here is where I want to go. Here is where I want to go. No, it doesn't work like that. Because remember the, pop the topography, some of the Earth's surface, they are not flat. And that's why. And some location is filled with water, like for example, river. If there's a river that flows across along this line, you cannot like put one sampling size exactly in the, in the middle of river or maybe across the river because the river may be very big that you cannot move uh, conveniently across the river. That is why some of these light, they follow the, uh, the contours of a river. That means it, it, it is sampled along the river or maybe along the foothills, for example, or maybe alongside the gate. So this is the boundary of the gate, for example. You can do that if you have prior knowledge and you have enough justification. So travel site is no stranger, lah, yeah? It is very much acceptable. Or you have another justification. Let's say this is the line that separates two incidents, like for example, forest fire. You can split it. There's one area, for example, here is forest fire. They already burned out. The other one, that, which is not, then you can put a line that separates them. Go 10, 20 meters away from this line, and then you start collecting sample. Also can. Remember what I said just now, the objective? It all depends on the objective. Yeah. Okay, now this one is a grid sample, grid sampling, plus you may have zone sampling. Like I said, this would be random sampling. If you don't know if the contamination is indeed happened, you can use randomized sample. 
or you can use this grid sampling. This is when you know that this area, why? I don't know for some reason that this area is barricaded. Maybe the fence area of a, a, of a factory that caused the contamination. So you can follow this zone. Yeah, it's very much up to us. Lah. There's no strict rules. But number of sites needs to be determined, uh, especially when you don't know where the contamination has happened. So grid sampling is a good idea. Now, this one is part of the judgmental sampling. And most of the time, it's either judgmental, systematic, or stratified. Most of the soil contamination, you already have prior knowledge, unless if it's an open dump. So let's say if you have here an area where it is contaminated prior, uh, uh, before this prior, there is a uh, factory where it, where it has a lot of chemicals. Uh, they have different storage. And these are the information that you have prior to sampling and you, make, can, you should make use of it. Because contamination usually happens at a certain area where the operation is happening. Yeah. So examples right here, I will explain, you can read it yourself. Or if you know that the area is inherently uh, contaminated due to activities, like if this is the industrialized zone, so more samples here. The others residential may not be, but you still have to know kind of, to see how far they migrate. But grid sampling is, if you have no knowledge, yeah, use this one, grid sampling. This one is the grid sampling for farmers in the United States just to gauge how much of nutrient that the soil have. Nowadays, they no longer do this. They just put online sensor, stick it in the soil, and they have information 24-7 given to them. That is nowadays, like, yeah. Uh, and then for the information, how oh, is the pH, the phosphorus, and potassium. So phosphorus and potassium are the two major macro elements or micronutrients needed by plants. pH is the one that controls their release. Uh, okay. So done, the planning. Now we are moving on to the equipments. So what you're looking here is the major, lah, the so-called, the possibly the only instrument lah, that many of us soil scientists are using. It's called an auger. There are many types. Now the recent field trip, the recent academic visit to Shure Camp, you have seen lah, the many, many types of the tips, this connection, uh, the only thing that you guys haven't done is the actual, the actual usage, hands-on usage, which I think I will going to give it to you later on, uh, yeah? once we come back from this prior break later. Okay, soil auger is used for sampling depth of 1 to 2 meters. Beyond that, it's not suitable. You're going to need a machine auger. Now, this one is hand auger operated by human. There are also other augers with motor. Uh, you can use that, yeah. So this one is a is a is a the, the simplest auger lah. Now this one is usually used in golf course where they have uh, some gardeners that they need to uh, constantly monitor the soil nutrient inside the lawn so that their lawn can grow very healthily. And some of them can be very handy. It comes together with a handle just beside this one and it's not meant to be pushed down by your hand, but your legs. This one comes in very handy. You don't even need to use any effort. Just step on it, goes down, twist a bit, then you have all the soil samples inside this core. Yeah, how do we remove it? Either you stick your finger and push it out or you can use a, let's say, a trowel or a spade and then you push it down any way you want. Okay, class activity. There are five groups that I last time uh, asked the big, big, big groups lah, to split into five groups and then wanted to find out what are these auger. And of course, uh, there's only you alone, so no need. Lah. You, can, you can find out yourself what are these. These are the other types of auger that is not so popular, but they exist. You can find them out. I can say that most of the auger that we're going to use in soil science or soil sampling is just hand auger because they are the, the most, uh, what they say, convenient to use. Okay, now next one is uh, we need to learn about the zones of the so-called groundwater because soil samples usually when you use auger is collected here on top, the soil surface. 
but if you go deep enough, you're going to reach water table. And when you collect soil that deep, then you might want to consider where is your water table. Uh, because some, I mean, some part of the soil sampling also covers sampling its groundwater or soil solution. So there are many techniques that you can use. Either you use a lysimeter or you use a uh, the lab the lab experiment like, yeah? uh, you take the soil sample uh, you drain the moisture or you you centrifuge it there are many techniques so we're going to go through a few let's like, start with destructive soil solution method now why, why they say destructive is that you will need to excavate the soil and bring it into the lab so you're going to leave a lot of cavities on the surface so that's what they call destructive and the soil that, that has been analyzed will not be recoverable or you can say it, it you will go to disturb it lah, yeah okay now the first technique is centrifuge drainage in which the soil that they have moisture will be centrifuge just like maybe you spin around so that the soil will go to fall to the bottom and then on the surface you're going to have this moisture now this technique either you add moisture to extract it and centrifuge or if you have a really, really saturated soil, then you can centrifuge directly. But usually you need to add more water because soil is not supposed to have too much of water. So this one, you need to add water. Like, yeah. The other one is exactly that. You add water, saturation extract method. So you need to add a certain amount of water and you need to know what's the volume. Once they have been like extracted, then the contaminants, once after you measure it, you have to make corrections lah, based on how much water you have added. So this one is quite simple and straightforward and they, they cannot, you cannot return this soil to its original state. Lah, yeah? The structure will be damaged at this step. Now the other two is non-destructive, which means that the soil will not be disturbed. Well, you need to disturb the first time lah, maybe, but uh, you don't going to leave too big a cavity inside the soil. Now there are two types of uh, the, the instrument, yeah, the, the instrument used to collect soil moisture here is called lysimeter. There are two types. One is zero tension, the other one is you have tension. Now why they are called zero tension? Look at here. This one is the soil. Inside this soil, it is buried with a device called lysimeter. Inside here, you have on top a screen. So it's a mesh lah. May, it has to be very durable. Most likely is ceramic or maybe is uh, metal. And on top of here, you have sand pack and it's covered by soil. So whatever the moisture coming from the soil surface on this top, it will going to flow down by itself by gravity collected by this lysimeter and it can be drawn away like, from this tube using a vacuum pump. Okay. So you can see this one is like using gravity to flow down and this air inlet is uh, allowed, is, 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 look, is situated so that it can like uh, allow the air to go out because when water comes in, the air need to, the air will build pressure. So it will, do, it will need to come out from this air inlet. Yeah. Now this technique, zero tension lysimeter, is only useful when the soil is extremely wet. Like, for example, farmlands, they constantly spray water. So it is very saturated. So it, it relies on gravity to pull it down. But on the other hand, most of the soil, they are not supposed to be very saturated, at least most of the soil, not artificially watered, yeah? especially in dry region. So there is another technique we call a uh, suction lysimeter. This is a tube. It is much longer than you can see right here. And at the bottom, they have a porous membrane. So this porous membrane, once you dig a hole, you stick this lysimeter into the soil and then start pumping. So this will be locked, uh, will be air locked, and then you start pumping. Once it's pumped out, it builds a vacuum and water starts coming in. It will flows in. Once you finish with all those uh, water collection, stop the pump. And then you can use a vacuum pump from the other side to draw the water sample over. There's an instruction video where you can see later, uh, which I won't going to explain too long. Like, yeah? Now, this one is what I like. It's called Rhizon Sampler. 
and it's part of the product which is sold by Surecare last time. I remember I bought 12 from them and it cost me 3,000. 3,000 for 12 pieces of this riser sampler. Yeah, yeah, the number yeah, you can see right here in the soil column, that is equivalent to a, a cost of a motorbike. Believe it or not, this simple thing costs as much as a motorbike. But there is a good reason because they are so convenient when you want to go for uh, soil sampling and soil moisture sampling. Because what you need to do is this uh, tube, this so-called tube, they have a porous membrane, very similar to lysimeter, but much, much smaller. What you need to do is you need to screw a hole at this uh, soil wall and then you stick it in. Then after that, connect it. So this is a connector from this end. This end connects here. This is the same. You just need a needle and stick it inside a vacuum tube. And then this vacuum tube will start draw in soil moisture. But this one, I think, is very convenient, but also expensive. But uh, usually during my times when I study, I use the second option. I stick it with a syringe, pulls it, it creates a, vo uh, a vacuum, and then it will still do its job. Lah. The only thing I need to transfer a lot. And then finally, you can use the peristaltic pump. So one, two, and three. Which one is the best? Number one. Because this one will will exclude you from the requirement of having to transfer your sample. With that, you will, you will greatly minimize cross-contamination and also the error. So number one is much preferred if you have the money. Lah. Okay, sampling soil air. Well, just now I explained about soil moisture. The next one is air. Now, air is sample if you want to look at the air contaminants coming from the soil. Now, soil, especially those that were coming from industrialized area like a railway, for example, uh, in KL, uh, the, the main railway station, KL Central, it used to be a depot for a lot of carriages. So diesel, lubricant, uh, they are, they are, I mean, they are, they are all over. Before KL Central is built, there were many studies because once you have all those oil inside, VOC is, is guaranteed. Lah. And you cannot build a, 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 a railway station that filled with VOC because you might see a lot of people get sick. So a lot of studies lah, during that time. Uh, to to gauge yeah how much the VOC is already in the soil so actions can be taken what well, I mean either they move over to another side which is cleaner or they they need to do remediation how much remediation work is needed yeah okay now this technique uh, they have three types simple method advanced method and also passive sampling now the simple method is very simple just dig a hole using an auger and then from there, you just you pump and, and collect air inside that hole. As easy as that. It can be acceptable. Yeah. Now, another method is advanced method where you use a pump, not really a pump, like, yeah, uh, a probe. You stick it inside the soil and then let the let the reading, or the, I mean, the real-time re reading happens. And you can also use a passive sampling where you use a media, a media where you stick it inside the soil and that media will start absorbing these contaminants. So after that, what do you do? You extract it and then you analyze. So they use activated charcoal or any absorbance, lah, yeah? any absorbance that you think you can use, but usually activated charcoal because they don't, uh, discriminate they can absorb everything everything that's already in the soil so this is possibly one lah. there may be other uh, other mediums being used for pa passive sampling but activated charcoal is used lah. this is light yeah okay so another part of sampling is sediment now this one is the soil below a water so this one can be the sediment of a lake or sediment of a river, but it is sediment. It's part of the soil. Uh, may not be exactly the same, but you can still collect it. How is how do you collect? You're going to need the, either these four, all of which are extremely heavy and has to be operated if possible using a machine. Like, yeah? 
is like a strong arm that you can hold this and drop it down because dropping down is easy. Pulling up is a different story. It is extremely heavy. Why? Because not only you, it is bogged down by the weight of the soil, let's remember it also carries moisture. It's the weight of water that we're talking about. So it's not light, yeah? it's very heavy. It will break your back if you operate it using human. You need machine. Uh, how these things work is very similar to Van Dorn sampler that we learned in water sampling. Only difference is it is metal and it has a scoop mechanism where it's usually open up. Like, yeah? uh, FSG actually have one. I'm not sure if it's a Pona grab sampler or Ekman grab sampler. Okay, they are open first. So this wire is attached to this uh, to this this part where they can hook it yeah so that it keeps it open now this messenger is a weight that is dropped from the top it drops down when it hits this part it will go in to detach the, the the cable or the chain and it will close so once closed you pull up it will keep all your soil sample or the sediment sample inside the way it works also very similar to peterson grab and also boner grab Although it's a mechanism that's a bit different here, la, yeah. Uh, now we do have this uh, uh, sediment core sampler, the D that you can see right here, in which, me, in which inside this uh, this tube, there, there's a there's a there's a tube, plastic tube that you need to insert inside this area, this part of this uh, sediment core, and then. Once it is inserted, then the operator will going to drop la, from above a boat uh, into the riverbed where it will stick into the riverbed and it will lock by itself. So you pull it slowly and you detach this tube. So the sediment will be locked inside this tube. And FSG also have a unit of this. It's inside the soil lab and you can find it inside the lab if you come to a main campus. Okay, now I think we are moving on to the last part, which I think, uh, I think we better move. Because if you're looking at... We only have uh, seven slides to go. Shall we uh, finish it up? Seven slides is like no time and we have one more hour. What do you think? Shall we finish it? It finished up. Yeah, seven slide. Let's do it, lah. Yeah. Okay. So the last part is guideline on handling and storage of soil sample, and that is easy, because in terms of soil samples, we usually do not preserve it. But if you really do, that is because it has VOC, lah. Yeah. Now VOC is something that you need special attention because of their volatile nature. Uh, in which we'll talk later about that one. But if you're just looking at other contaminants, nutrients, once they are inside the soil, they are stabilized quite some time. And once you collect it, just analyze immediately as, as quick as you possibly can. That should be okay. But remember, yeah, once soil sample is collected, you cannot uh, lock it inside the bucket. You have to air dry it, put it inside the air, expose it to air. Uh, but you have to analyze quite quickly, la, yeah. But some soils, they, they what they say, yeah? if they have volatile contaminants like VOC, then you cannot, yeah. So, so yeah, because of that, preservative is not used. If you're looking at just metal in organic contaminants, then you don't need preservative. You don't even need to put it in cold storage at four degrees Celsius. No, but unless you have like microbiological study then there's a different way of doing that uh, you swap instead of collecting the actual soil sample so usually soil samples when you collect it here is usually meant for physical and chemical analysis like yeah so yeah number three when the soil have a volatile contaminants like voc then you have to close it and you need some preservative in here the preservatives are methanol or sodium bisulfate so in terms of VOC analysis, you can say like, most of the soil sampling that happens nowadays, 
not only they determine the uh, metal contaminants, they also determine VOC. Yeah, especially the urbanized soil samples. Lah. They will definitely have a lot of oil. Now, oil also, they have high level or low level. So based on this different level, we use different kind of preservative. If it's high level, um, then you, is there, yeah. If it's high level, we use methanol. If it's low level, we use sodium bisulfate. Each of the so-called dosage is stated right here. So you will need to follow accordingly, lah, yeah? Otherwise, the VOC will not be well preserved and they might be uh, volatilized and you may have lost. You may suffer underestimation if they are lost. Uh, but of course, uh, these so-called vials, they can be available. And there are specialized vials where you can use uh, to, to collect these soil samples. And they have like a preservative that already packed inside vials and you can add into the soil once you have collected it. I will show you the images later. Lah. But remember, if it is VOC, after preservation, you will need to chill it at 4 degrees Celsius. So this can be said is the only preservation that you need to do. And it's only if you need to analyze VOC. Yeah. I mean, for very simple reason, like because they volatile. So that's why you need special care. Now, this is what I say, like, yeah? the so-called vials or sampler. It's called TerraCore sampler, where you just plug it in and then you break it, and then there are, there are preservatives that flows in. It can be quite very, it can be quite straightforward. Lah. This one is available in United States here. We just use soil core. Lah. Yeah, we don't use this one. Uh, oh yeah, for your information, methanol is toxic. It's not ethanol. Ethanol, you get drunk. Methanol, you get killed if you got exposed it. Yeah. Okay. Another one is when you use a uh, use sodium bisulfate. Now the concentration of bisulfate used is twenty uh, percent sodium bisulfate. Um, there are a lot of consideration that you need to give here. Is that the soil cannot have calcium carbonate in here? Calcareous soil. If you have calcium carbonate, it may react with bisulfate to release carbon dioxide. So that's why they say they might explode. Uh, but usually, not many soils they have cal calcium. Like, yeah? Even if they have calcium, guys, and if you're exposed to VOC, the alkalinity will, be, will naturally degrade a little bit of the VOC. But if it doesn't, then maybe you need to like collect acidis. They keep it airtight maybe and they keep it at low temperature because low temperature not only they can slow down the uh, bacterial degradation but also to minimize its volatilization so that is why it needs to be cooled down yeah and then i think the rest is more or less what we have uh, explained earlier it's just bisulfate 20 percent, and then the ratio as you can see right there five gram Okay, now chain of custody, I will not going to explain because why last time during the first lecture, we already explained it. So I will skip. Now the next one. So directly after you collected the soil samples that, uh, that contains VOC, we all know that the soil is a very good solvent for oil. But at times when the level is not high enough, you may need to do something. Like earlier, if the contaminants is quite low, you will need a lot more samples at. Okay, but you cannot analyze all that big sample size. You will need to first extracting all the contaminants. Okay, so this is how we extract it using a various uh, solvent that you can see right here. And alongside with all other techniques or analytes, we extract them using solvent. And then we reduce the amount by volatilization of the solvent. So you concentrate it strong enough, high enough concentration to be analyzed later. Uh, 
there are a lot of techniques that I think we I, I will not go to explain, but the most uh, traditional one, uh, the most traditional one I can say is right here. The solid phase extraction, SPE, and also soxlet extraction. The others like liquid-liquid extraction, I think nowadays they are no longer valid. If not mistaken, uh, yeah? last time they are valid, but nowadays you can't really see too many of these uh, this liquid liquid extraction funnel nowadays. Most of them they are SPE. SPE when you read uh, what do you say? Uh, when, when you read research paper, a lot of the uh, uh, research regarding uh, volatile organic carbon they use this one, yeah, solid phase extraction. The other one is Soxler extraction. They are one very similar to uh, liquid liquid extraction, but they have a very specialized device to do it. Uh, but like I said, like, we are not chemistry. And, and one more thing is that uh, when we coming to this part, extraction of organic from soil, it's not said to be part of the sampling work. It's more of a pre-treatment before you enter the lab. And most of the time, extraction already happened inside the lab after the, uh, the chain of custody form has been signed off between the sampler and also the chemist, the, uh, the one that analyzes the sample. But I want to add this one so that I hope you go back and, and check like, what are these extraction. Because based on this, you will, you will know that uh, how volatile organic carbon is analyzed from the soil. So once again, what you are seeing right here is not part of the sampling work, but rather the intermediate layer yeah? from soil to uh, from soil sampling to soil analysis is where you get extraction. So with that, that is all.